So I'm a twin. I think some of you, if not most of you, probably already knew that. I shared a sermon with you last August where I talked about how nearly identical my twin brother Peter and I were. And I know that what some of you are thinking. I know what some of you are thinking, and, and I, you know, I applaud you for keeping it to yourselves and not saying it out loud, but I know what some of you are thinking. Good heavens, there are two of them. <laughs> so Peter, he's the smart one. He's got his PhD in high energy physics from the University of Notre Dame, uh, Bozen, Einstein condensates, if you're into that type of thing. But uh, he's the smart one. He's a bit taller than I am, an inch, maybe two, depending on how much I've shrunk over the years. I have a cleft chin, which I cover with a beard. He doesn't have that. Other than that, we look pretty similar. Here's a, here's a photo, Lori. Here's a photo of the two of us. See if you can tell them apart. Hint, I'm not the one that's in the middle, okay? Good enough, Lori, you can go on. Now, for most of our lives, we've assumed that we were fraternal twins, not identical twins. We didn't look exactly identical, just very, very similar. So several years back, we took one of those 23andMe genetic tests. You know the ones I'm talking about? You spit in the test tube and you send it off, and three weeks later they send you a report saying that you're fat, bald, and going gray. And, and you think to yourself, I could have saved 100 bucks by just looking in the mirror? <laughs> At any rate, we both took this test, and lo and behold, we come to discover that despite our differences, of which there were a few, we were genetically identical twins. And that's an odd thing to learn when you're 55 years old in your mid-50s, but there you go. So what makes this discovery all the stranger is that for all of our similarities, we fought like cats and dogs. I don't know, maybe it's because we were similar. For as long as I can remember, my mom, not Rose, but my biological mom, kept saying, why can't the two of you just get along with one another? I mean, it's a fair enough question, and my answer would always be the same. Mom, it's because he's boneheaded. He's an idiot, and I'm not. I mean, don't get me wrong, I love him, but he's an idiot. He's just like me. My mom would say, your brothers, for heaven's sakes, you need to love one another. You need to stick together and take care of one another. And most importantly, you need to stop kicking one another in the shins. We refer to these as my mother's one another commands. Now, it turns out my mom had not cornered the market on this type of command. There is a Greek word that appears 100 times in the New Testament, and the word in question is alelon, alelon, from which we get the English word alelon. That we get the English word nothing, <laughs> nothing. As far as I know, there isn't a single English word that derives from alelon. In fact, if you're going to translate this Greek word alelon into English, you must use at a minimum two words, and those two words are. Drum roll. One another, one another. You win, the, you win the Oreo cookie. I don't have any Oreo cookies, though. Sorry about that. Now, of these 100 occurrences of one another, 47 are actual commands to us. About a third of those have to do with the church getting along with one another, unity, if you will. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a, in a couple of weeks. About a third of them have to deal with loving one another, and this is the one we're going to look at today. And about 15% of them have to deal with humility and deference to one another. There's even four of them, I kid you not, that have to do with kissing. They have to do with kissing one another. Now, there is something important to remember about all of these one another commands, and this is something that I want you to understand there are a host of you-centric commands in the Bible. Perhaps even most of the commands in the Bible are you-centric. If you love me, 
you will keep my commandments. Uh, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Honor your mother and your father. You get the idea. You, you don't need to be a community to love God with all your heart, with all your soul. It's a you do this command. On the other hand, these alelon, these one another commands, imply by their very nature a community. These are commands that seek to teach us how to function as a collection of individuals and not as isolated individuals. Does that make sense? You follow me here? Translation, unless you're a hermit, monk, living in total isolation, you need to know this stuff. So this week, I want to look at the command to love one another. And the list of love one another's pulled straight from the Bible is an impressive list. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you should love one another. My command is this, love one another as I have loved you. Let no de debt remain outstanding except the continuing de uh, debt to love one another. Love one another deeply from the heart, for this is the message you've heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Serve one another humbly in love. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Be devoted to one another in love. And this isn't even all of them. Now, I have to be honest. I always find this a bit of an odd command. I mean, we're Christians. Love is supposed to be a part of the package, isn't it? It's like telling a fish he needs to breathe water. And yet we have this love thing show up again and again and again. This one form of the command, love one another, shows up some 15 times all by itself and a few more times, and I shared some of them with you, combined with other things. It's crazy. To go back to my fish, fish breathing water metaphor, it's like the fish is flopping around on the, on the deck or the dock, and it knows that it wants to get back in the water, but it's having a hard time getting it done. Maybe this fish out of water metaphor is the perfect metaphor for mankind. I mean, we made one little mistake in the Garden of Eden, you know, with an apple, and we screwed it up. We know we want to get right with God, but darn it, that apple was good. We have a hard time loving one another the way that truly reflects heaven, just as that poor fish has a hard time trying to breathe water on dry land. Now, I'm going to try to make a case for you that these 15 love one another commands are calling us to a heavenly pre-apple Garden of Eden style love. Jesus helps us out here. In the Bible, specifically the Gospel of John chapter 13, Jesus gives us and gives his disciples what would be one of their final sets of commands. He says this, he says, a new command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, you must love one another. By this, everyone will know you are my disciples if you love one another. Just ponder that for a second. What that implies. The way we've been doing love as Christians was wrong. Christian love is somehow meant to be different. Why, why, why would he say, a new command I give you? Haven't Jews been loving one another for a while? I mean, isn't that part of what it means to be a, a mom and a dad and a friend and a neighbor? But Jesus says, I give you a new command. This is something new. Does that make sense to any of you guys? Jesus demonstrates by his love sacrifice. 
he demonstrates his love by sacrifice. He demonstrates sacrifice by his love. Abraham with Isaac on the altar and no last minute reprieve. This is Jesus demonstrating sacrifice. This is Jesus demonstrating love. This is Jesus saying that sacrifice and love are somehow linked. And maybe somehow this is part of that new command that I give you. It's not enough to love your neighbor. You have to demonstrate that love with sacrifice. No Isaiah reprieve, you know, poor I, you know, Abraham with his, with his son up there on the altar getting ready to go at it. And he gets this reprieve. Jesus doesn't get that. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this. Love one another as I have loved you. So here we see Jesus trying to guide us back to the water. We're the fish flopping around on the deck, and he's trying to guide us back into the water. Two times Jesus says essentially the same thing, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. I was the example. You need to follow that example. And again, love one another as I have loved you. What's Jesus doing here? He's set an example and he's telling us to follow it. You know, there are many types of love out there. I'm sure you guys, you know, appreciate that. There are many types of love. I love bacon. Who here doesn't like bacon? Everybody here like bacon? Yeah, you like bacon. I love bacon. I really do, especially when you get that, you know, magic place between crispy and, and chewy. But loving your neighbor like bacon is inappropriate at worst, just plain strange at best, and probably illegal. Jesus is asking all of us to get one of those WWJD bracelets. You know the ones I'm talking about, what would Jesus do bracelets? As I have loved you, so you must love one another. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. As a church, we're pretty good at this. But how about as individuals? It's easier when somebody else does the heavy lifting, isn't it? Everyone hearing my voice today needs to love sacrificially. If you're the one sacrificing for others, great. Jesus is spoke specifically to you. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. If you're the one receiving the sacrifice that another person is giving, great. Jesus spoke directly to you. As I have loved you, so you should love one another. Every one of us needs to love and give sacrificially, not to the church, but to each other, to one another. A lay alone, sacrificial love. Can it be through the church? Sure. But it doesn't need to be. And just a word of advice, we talked about a little bit of this at a session meeting. Just a word of advice, when it comes to this type of what would Jesus do, WWJD love, no one needs to do everything. No one needs to do everything, but everyone, hear me here, everyone needs to do something. No one needs to do everything, but everyone needs to do something. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. The Apostle John shares a, a similar set of thoughts in a letter that he wrote called 1 John, specifically chapter 3, verse 11. 
he says this. He says, this is the message you've heard from the beginning. We should love one another. What does that mean? That means it's the first principle. We've heard this from the beginning. This is a fundamental tenet of what it means to be a follower of Christ and the lover of God. This is a message you've heard from the beginning. We should love one another. A few paragraphs later, he says this. He says, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Jesus says, I am the truth and the way and the light. We got to show that love in truth and in action. In each, each case, this how to love question is answered by taking action. Jesus says, follow my example. As I have loved you, so you should love others. A lot of times in this world, I don't know why this is. It's because we took a bite of that apple. It's all about me. I want to grab one of those burgers that says, you know, have it your way. I love receiving. Every now and then I like giving. But giving isn't my priority. Helping somebody else isn't my priority. Getting from somebody else, boy, that's nice. I like that. But boy, if you're getting from somebody, you need to think real hard. Are you giving to somebody as well? Because that's the Christian life. I think there's an important point here. Most of us are pretty good at loving ourselves. It's loving that other guy that can be tough. This isn't to say we have trouble loving other people. It's to say we have a hard time loving them as much as we love ourselves. We have a hard time loving them when they're not particularly lovable. We have a hard time loving them when it's inconvenient for us to love them. And here's the scary part. Jesus' love for us was so extreme that he was willing to jump on a grenade for us. He was willing to, to push us out of the way of his feeding truck. He was willing to die on a cross for us. He even tells us that there is no greater love than laying down your life for another. We've been talking, we've been talking about sacrificial love. That's sacrificial love. Now, there's another important piece to all of this, maybe even the most critical piece to all of this, the whole mysterious loving one another command. Earlier in John 13, I shared a few of the things Jesus said to his followers shortly before he was to be arrested and ultimately killed. He said, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. And then he says this, by this, Everyone will know you are my disciples if you love one another. It's that last piece I want us to think about. Jesus says at one point that as the Father in heaven loves him, so Jesus loves us. And, and as he's saying this, as he loves us, so we should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. How are we to know who is a Christian? A Christian is someone that loves like Jesus. How do we know who Jesus is? He's the one who loves like God. The type of love that God demonstrated to Jesus is heavenly love. It's Garden of Eden, pre-apple love. The type of love that Jesus demonstrated to us is also heavenly love. It's Garden of Eden, pre-apple love. God sacrificed his only son. He loved us so much. Jesus sacrificed his very life. He loved us so much. Seems silly. Seems silly to me that I don't love my neighbor enough to buy him a cup of coffee every now and then. The command to love one another is pretty crazy and it's pretty intense. We're called to surrender all that we are if that's what it takes to love our neighbor. As a church, we're called to sacrifice all that we are if that's what it takes to love our neighborhood. 
Folks, that's a big ask. No wonder so many of us feel like that poor fish flopping around on the dock. Here's the thing. Every journey begins with that first small step. Honestly, learning to love one another with a sacrificial heavenly love is not any different. You just have to take that first small step in the right direction and let the Spirit of the Lord guide you and take that next small step in the right direction and then that next small step in the right direction and then another and then another and then another. You with me here? Can I, can I get an amen? Can you imagine... When and I said this to you before, I know I've said this to you before because it's one of the most favorite things I ever say up here as a pastor. But you can you imagine what this world would look like if every man, if every woman, if every child made the other guy their number one priority? I have a hard time picturing that, but I'm guessing it would look a lot like heaven. Let's pray. Father in heaven, may we see Christ in the actions of others. May others see Christ in our actions. May our church be seen by our community as a collection of sincere and authentic and loving Christians. May we each of us bring a little piece of heaven to someone's life this day and every day. May we continue to be faith-filled. May we continue to be bet the farm. May we continue to be risk-takers, never insulting you, God, with small thinking or safe living. All this I ask in the name of the one who would teach us to love sacrificially, Jesus the Christ. Amen.